lot, of, but we happened to be in movies eating them, and you know, just one of those things that that stuck out to me at this particular moment because we were we were there, and uh, we looked over, and there was an older couple. Obviously, they were they were married, but they were not making eye contact. They were not communicating at all. They were just eating their food, going through the routine of eating their food. And I remember our conversation went from there was, "Hey, I never." want to get there. I don't ever want to get to the point where we don't even look at each other or even speak when we eat. We just, we've got it, we're married, but I don't want to ever get to that point where we just take each other for granted. We're so familiar with each other that we don't take time to keep the closeness that's in our marriage. And, and you know what I'm talking about. You've seen those people in some and, and some people will just say, well, you know, I told you I love you when we got married. If it ever changes, I'll tell you then. But I don't like that kind of attitude. I think it's got to be a growing intimacy that, that happens. And I'm not talking about just the physical. I'm talking about a, a close fellowship that, that develops. And, and, I, and I remember having that conversation. Never want to get to that point. And, and you know, you translate that over into a spiritual walk. You see, you know, the... the the, the closeness we've had with Christ, we've been talking about our identity and now we're moving into this, this intimacy, this closeness, this fellowship that we want to have with Christ. But how many people do you know who at one time, man, there was a seal, there was a fire, I mean, there was something that said, you know, God has, has redeemed me, set me free, he's forgiven me, he's, he's, he's leading my life and I know it. And, and, and you're willing to make sacrifices for the Lord, whether it's time or finances or whatever. And then something seems to settle in and you, you all of a sudden, you've got all the answers and you don't need that closeness with the Lord. You've, you've turned, and we see it all the time, you've turned what was meant to be a close relationship with a living God, breathing, heartbeat of a relationship. We turn it into some kind of religious tradition. All guilty of that. There's not a person in here that's not guilty of that. But I want you to know that's not what God intended. It's not what He intended. In, in fact, here's another thought about closeness with the Lord. Um, ever had those people that come up to you and say, God told me to tell you something? I don't like that. I don't ever like that. And that's why I say it publicly. Don't do that to me. Uh, because it almost sounds like I've got this hotline to God that you don't have, and so I'm going to tell you what He wants to tell you, and He's going to tell you through me. We've got that kind of intimacy with God, and I'm thinking, I, I just don't see that, man. I mean, if it's a prophetic word according to His word, and it's from there, okay, I'm going to receive it, but don't, don't go into that. And, and sometimes that's the way we want to treat intimacy, is I've got a hotline, you don't have a hotline, I've got it, hopefully someday you'll get it. And, and that's another way we look at it, and that, that is very... Very frustrating. That's very frustrating. And, and uh, many of you will remember this. In 2002, a, ser a series of commercials started. They actually ran uh, nine years on television. And uh, what happens is there would be a guy in a gray jacket, had his glasses. He's back in commercials now for another product of, of the same, uh, uh, same, same juncture. But, but he'd have that great jacket, he'd have his cell phone up to his ear, he's traveling all over the country, and he simply says what? Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? And I think that describes much of our walk with the Lord sometimes. We read about the things in the Scripture, and we hear things preached, and we, we see what somebody else has, and we say, but Lord, do you hear me? Because it seems like the, the heavens are like brass sometimes, as the Scripture says. And I'm praying, but they're bouncing off, and I'm not sure, God, how close a relationship we really have. And I got to be more because listen if it's just some religious thing I don't want to be a part of it I, I want to believe, believe it's a living breathing relationship with my creator that he established and you know this is the way he intended it from the beginning in fact I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3 with me uh, just a moment this is the very beginning you know in Genesis you got Genesis 1 that gives you this big out there view of how God uh, uh, created or why he created it and, and then we come in a little bit narrower in how he created man and woman. And then in chapter 3, it gets a little more intimate to what was going on in that garden. Because you see, God intended, when he created man, he created that garden, it was the perfect environment. It was the, it was the relationship with his people that was intimate and close. And, and, and he was their everything. And, and, and they knew it. And there was this incredible relationship. And we hear about that. And we know that it existed, but then all of a sudden something happens. And you remember, the Lord had given them one command. Don't, don't eat of the fruit of that particular tree. 
what you do, you, you will die. I mean, they were still going to physically breathe for a season, but they were going to be spiritually dead, separated from God. And lo and behold, what happens? The serpent comes, tempts Eve. Eve um, eats of the tree, and she gives to her husband, who all the time, it says, was there with her through this whole thing. And he eats, and then all of a sudden, we, we come upon uh, verse 8. And look what it says in verse 8 and 9. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Where are you? This is an interesting uh, little passage in where, where it's at. And I, I want to draw some things out of this to talk about this intimacy. And then we're going to move into the New Testament a little bit with Jesus. Uh, first of all, the man and the woman were created for that intimacy with God, the Father. I mean, they were created. I mean, and, and from what I read, and as I study the verbiage of this passage, it was like this was a regular occasion that in the cool of the day, they would walk. Now, what that looked like, I do not know. I, I do not know if it, it was maybe God allowed himself to come in, in human form like Jesus to walk with them. I don't know, but I do know that in the cool of the day, it looks like they regularly took walks. And I thought about that a little bit. I thought, why do you take walks, especially in the cool of the day? And I, I thought about a couple of things. I thought, one, is just pleasurable, especially this garden, man. It was beautiful, gorgeous. And it was the cool of the day, which meant, man, it was probably just something they could, they could go. And then another thing I thought about is, is uh, maybe it was just a way... For them to intimately commune with the lover of their souls. The one who created them and the one that just took all pleasure and joy in. You know, it's almost like it's that cool of the day. I'm with the one that I'd rather be with than anybody else. And that's what we're doing. Or, or maybe, maybe it was uh, one of these walks. You, you ever, you ever uh, come home and with your spouse or whatever and you just need to catch up on the day? Maybe they're just walking with, the, with God the Father in the cool of the day and, and saying, man, Father, didn't you see how we named those animals today? Man, Lord, didn't you see that great waterfall? Didn't you see the beauty and everything? And, and I, I, I'm just so exuberant. What we tell the Father about the whole day? Or maybe it was this. Maybe it was the time of day when they would just check in together in this infant encounter and the Father would say, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. But this is what we're going to do next week. And just, just kind of give guidance and instruction. I, I don't know what it looked like. And it, the scriptures don't tell me. It just lets me know that they, I believe that they regularly walked in the cool of the day. And what happens on this particular day is, is they come and uh, the fall has happened. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve, something has shifted in the relationship because of their disobedience. It, it, it's almost like a blockage has happened, you know? You know what it's like when you've had a close relationship and then all of a sudden there's a blockage here. Something is wrong. And, and what happened with Adam and Eve is they, de they developed this independent spirit. Instead of being dependent upon the Father now, they're going to go make something to hide their guilt and shame and, and clothe themselves and cover themselves. And that guilt and shame. Imagine guilt and shame for the first time coming on somebody. We almost live with it. It's not of the Lord. And guilt and shame is not of the Lord. Conviction is, but guilt and shame is not. And how many people are walking in guilt and shame thinking, oh, God can never forgive me. And, and they're walking in that all, all of a sudden. And you know what's interesting? The other thing that happened when they had, when they had sinned here is that, that they lost the awesomeness of God. And you know, here's what tells me that they lost the awesomeness of God. If they're trying to hide from the God that sees everything. And so they've lost his awesomeness. So when they, when they fell, when this sin occurred, there was this blockage to this beautiful intimacy that God intended for them. And then all of a sudden, here comes God, the Lord, and he says, he says this. He says, where are you? Now, to me, i got to look at that a little bit. God, if you're all-knowing and you're everywhere, why would you ask this question of where are you? Why, why would you ask that question? And, and let me tell you when, you, when you understand the verbiage a little bit, he's almost saying this. Why aren't you where you're supposed to be? 
You hear the conviction behind that question? Asking where are you, he, he knew where they were. He was wanting them to understand, do you know where you're at? Why aren't you with this intimate closeness with me? Why are you now distant from me? Why is there this blockage? God knew He was wanting them to understand that this had happened. And, and, and the Lord asked that question because He knew that their purpose for life was in Him alone. And from this day forward, things are going to be different. It's going to be different. It's going to be different than how I created it to be because of the fallenness of man. And I, so I read on a little bit here in Genesis chapter 3, and a lot of things happened from then on out. We know that God cursed the, uh, the serpent, that God uh, told woman that she would uh, have pain in child rearing and child bearing, that the husband Work would not be the curse, but the hardness of work, the toil that was going to come with it, was going to be a, a something that he was going to have because the ground was cursed. So I thought, what happened when the intimacy with God got broken? And let me just share with you a couple of things that I think happened. One is guilt and shame came in. I come back to that because guilt and shame had never been there before. And there's some of you that walk in this room because of your past, you've got guilt and shame. Because of what you did last night, maybe you got guilt and shame. I don't know, but it just comes and that intimacy is broken. Uh, another thing I thought about is that from this moment on, mankind was going to look for other things to fill their pleasure in their life other than the Father. From this moment on, they were going to look for other things. And that has come right into our day. When God Himself is all we need, and he knows that, and that's intimacy there. Mankind from that moment on was going to look for other things to fill that, that void. And we're still doing it today in our life. And we worship hedonism, we worship pleasure because of that. Here's another thing. Selfishness was going to come in. Remember this. Remember when, when the father came to Adam and he said, where are you? And then he says this, did you eat of the tree? And, and what did he say? That woman you gave me. Blame was going to come into the scenario from here on out. It was selfishness. I'm going to protect my skin at all costs. And so God, what happened is, is that woman, and then he blamed God that you gave me. So it's all pointing back to you, God. It's your fault. And then he went to the woman and said, what about you? And of course, she's going to blame the serpent. From that day forward, the, the, the brokenness of the intimacy was going to lead to selfishness that was going to pull, pull into this. W one other thing that I think happened, well, let me, let me share with you too, because when you read the curses that happen, the woman is going to have pain in childbearing, and not only in childbearing, but in she's going to be desiring her husband and, and, and uh, to lord over him, and then uh, the man is going to be working hard. I think there's a picture here of a curse that's about to happen that we are living out today, and that's the curse of busyness. <laughs> Tell me if busyness does not destroy intimacy. Closeness to God is destroyed because of the lack of, uh, of time that we spend in, in that area. In fact, with intimacy, you need, you need time, you need transparency, and you need submission. And, and they're all going to be destroyed. The last thing that I think happened to destroy the intimacy, when this broke and happened, there was going to be self-sufficiency. Adam and Eve were going to say, I'm going to do it on my own from now on out. I don't need the Father. You see how this brokenness that God intended walking in the cool of the day, this closeness that He was their pleasure, He was their joy, He was their sufficiency, He was their lifeline, all of a sudden, because of the brokenness and the fall of man, that was done away with. And for centuries, man was going to try every way possible to rectify that. But it wasn't until Jesus came into the picture. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 11. You're going to be dancing around the scriptures here for the next few minutes. So just hang with me. Keep your Bibles open. But in Luke chapter 11, what happens is, is the disciples have been following Jesus. And what's happening is, is they're seeing Jesus with this intimate walk with the Father. It's like Jesus was just... And, I, and Jesus in His humanity, yes, He is God, but in His humanity, He limited Himself to where he, he needs the Father and He needs that intimacy. And they're seeing it in His life. 
And so in Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 1, all of a sudden, his disciple asked him a question. And it says this, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. I mean, here's, the, here's, the, here's what I think is unusual. I want you to grab this. They had watched Jesus. They had watched him walk on water. They had watched him heal the sick. They had watched him cast out demons. They had watched him walk in peace in the midst of all kinds of persecution. They had watched him multiply the fish and loaves. They had watched all of these things. They could have asked him for anything, but the one thing they noticed is that everything stemmed from his life of prayer and intimacy with the Father. So they didn't come up to him and say, man, could you teach us how to walk on water? Could you teach us how to get rid of those demons? No, they went and they said, can you teach us how to pray? Because they knew everything came out of his intimacy with the Father. And so that's what they asked him. Can you teach us? Can you teach us this one thing, how to pray? Because it seems like everything in you comes from prayer. We see that your power under control that we call meekness comes from prayer. Your power over the demonic comes from prayer. Your power over the human condition comes from prayer. Your power over nature comes from prayer. we got to know. we got to know about this intimacy that we see in you, that we long for. Turn over to Luke chapter 5 a minute. I want to look into Jesus' prayer life just a a couple of minutes. In Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, a simple little little, little two verses here because what has happened is once again Jesus is healing, Jesus is calling disciples, Jesus is driving out demonic spirits, He's doing all of these things. And in verse 15 of chapter 5 it says this, Yet the news about Him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I want to look at one more about his prayer life. Look with me over to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 and through 37. Once again, Jesus is about the, the, the business of ministering. It's very hectic what is going on. But this is what it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. These two passages tell us a little bit about Jesus' prayer life, what created that intimacy. And I, I want to share with you some of these things because I think they're key for us today. If, we're, if God has created us a certain way to have relationship with Him, what can we do to bring that closeness together? Well, look at Jesus' prayer life. And so here's some things that were important in Jesus' prayer life. Number one, He knew the importance of pulling away. He was not going to let the tyranny of the urgent control His life. He was going to pull away. He was going to pull away from the crowds. He wasn't going to let mob mentality ruin, uh, 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 run his life. He was going to pull away. And this was going to be important for him to pull away from the crowd. You see, what happens is, is that if we do not pull away, we're going to let culture and the news and the sports and the weather control our day. It just happens automatically. What do you do when you get up in the morning? I don't know what you might do. You may breathe a prayer. I don't know. But what most people do is they get up, check their email, check the news, check the weather, check the sports scores. And by the time you've ever opened your word or prayer, your day's already screwed up. Instead of pulling away from the mob, pulling away from the business. And listen, you've got to plan it. If you do not plan, you're going to fail. It's going to happen every time. And so what he did was, is he pulled away from the crowd. The second thing that I noticed about his prayer life is his prayer was his lifeline. It wasn't something that he could just 
put off. He, he knew that he needed that intimacy with the Father. If he was going to walk out the Father's will on a daily basis, he needed that intimacy. He, he knew it was like... It was like his oxygen. It was like his heartbeat. I mean, he was totally dependent on it. Imagine this. Some of you are, uh, maybe have done some scuba diving before. And uh, you, you know what it's like. You're dependent on your oxygen. You're going down deep. And when they're, when they're teaching you how to do it, you, you only go to a certain level because you're trying to learn and not panic. And then you go down deeper and you're deeper. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you become relaxed in what's going on. But you're, you've got to remember that your whole life is dependent upon that oxygen that you have there. And, and, and if we can come to grips that, you know, God holds my next heartbeat in His hands. He holds my next breath. And that if I can understand that I am dependent on Him for my lifeline. And that's what Jesus did. He, he walked with the Father in such an intimate way that the life that flowed him, out of Him, He was dependent on the intimacy with the Father. Here's another thought about Jesus' prayer life. When we read this, it was like he pulled away regularly. This was his habit. This was his lifestyle. It, 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 he pulled away regularly. It wasn't like, you see, aren't we guilty of this? Our prayer is great when the world's falling apart. When somebody's sick, we're great at prayer. When, some, when something's broken, we're great at prayer. We're, we're always good at prayer when things go wrong. Listen, I think that Jesus was so dependent on the Father, it was just a matter of regularly pulling away. I need you. And you've got to plan it. You've got to plan it. Or something busy is going to come in and take it away from you. Because the world's going to scream at you. Your convictions are going to whisper, but the world's going to scream at you. Last thing about Jesus' prayer life is this. It says that in this verse in Mark, it says he got up early and he left the house and went off to a solitary place. And I thought about that little phrase there, he left the house. And, and, and we're thinking, well, maybe the house was crowded, maybe this kind of thing. You know what, I, I almost, as I was meditating on this, I thought, you know, he left the familiar. A lot of times, the familiar takes you away from intimacy with God. You see, there's a difference between familiarity and intimacy. Pam and I have been married 37 years. I am very familiar with her. I know how she's going to respond when something happens. I know uh, how she's going to be. I, I know that there are certain things I shouldn't do because I've learned. I've become very familiar with her. But listen, there's a difference between familiarity and intimacy. We can, I, think, I think the problem that the church in America is struggling with today is that we have a culture of familiarity with God. Oh, God is great. God is good. Let's do church. Let's sing the songs. Let's do all that. We're very familiar, but I think our intimacy is struggling. And I think Jesus pulled away from the familiar. And there's times you just got to pull away from the familiar so that you can come to that place of new intimacy with God. There's a difference between familiar and intimate. Let me, let me just wrap this up today with a couple of so what's. The first one is this. If Jesus craved intimacy with the Father, how much more should we? If Jesus, when He was here on earth, craved that in intimacy with the Father, returning like it was to Adam and Eve in the beginning, that kind of intimacy, if, if, if Jesus Himself needed it and craved it, how much more shall we? But let me tell you, I think that we live in a day where the enemy is, enemy is doing everything he can to destroy that closeness that we need with God. And he's destroying it. And if, and if Jesus craved it, and, and let me tell you, his craving to be with the Father was incredible. One, one more so what is this. When we look at Jesus, walking closely with the Father was worth everything. Was worth everything. Let me tell you where I get this. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane? You remember Jesus is hours away. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. He's going to go through all of that persecution. And yet he's praying there. And the human, human side of you would have said, I want to get out of this any way possible. And his humanity was even crying out, God, if there's another way, let it happen. But then there was the breakthrough because the intimacy was more important than what he was about to go through. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. L let, me, let me look at that on an earthly perspective. 
I look at my relationship with Pam. I would rather be with her in an impoverished, backwoods situation than to be in Hawaii without her. I would rather be in, in a struggling position. You see, that's minor compared to what Jesus was saying. I would rather go through the cross with my Father looking upon me than to go without the cross, living it my way without Him. You see, that is the intimacy with God that He longs for, for us. It's for us to understand He is our pleasure. He is our all. He is, he is everything we need. You see how brokenness has destroyed that. Our sinfulness has broken that. But that's what He longs for, is that kind of closeness with us. And we see that lived out in the cross. And we see, we see that He longs for that. Let me go back to something I said earlier, and then I want to finish with a story. I said this, when it comes to intimacy with the Father, and it's like this in any relationship, it takes time, it takes transparency, and it takes submission. And you know what? One thing I learned about my relationship with the Lord is that when I, I am submitted to Him, but you know, He's actually submitted to me first by sending Jesus to die for me. When I was in seminary many years ago, uh, we used to have chapel daily. I didn't go daily, and that's not a bad thing because we used to get up at 5 o'clock to have to get in to drive into Fort Worth. So it wasn't mandatory. So I'm, I'm, I'm tr- it looks like I'm trying to make up for 30 years ago when I did something wrong. God, I'll go back to chapel. Uh, but we went, went to chapel one day, and Emmanuel Scott, African-American pastor, came to speak. And he was a very popular speaker. And he came and he spoke, and he was speaking on prayer. And he started, he, he had pre- and this is how it just made such an impact on me. He started telling a story about his grandson. He said his grandson would walk home from school every day, and before he would go home, he would go over to his grandfather's house, Emmanuel Scott's house, and just be with him. He would just go over there and be with him. And uh, he would, every day, he would just show up to go spend time with his grandfather. And so... Uh, Emmanuel said, uh, he said, so I just figured, man, I want to do something for my grandson. I want to do something for him. And he said, he said, do you need anything? His grandson said, well, I'd like some new tennis shoes. He said, well, let's go get some new tennis shoes. He said, so they went to the mall and Emmanuel Scott said, now we're going back many years, but, but still, he said, he said, it's been a long time since I'd bought tennis shoes, especially for a young boy that's growing. He said, and they were very expensive compared to what I was thinking. But you know, I got them for him anyway. I got him those tennis shoes. And then he said this. He looked at us and he said, you know why I got him those tennis shoes? He said, I got him those tennis shoes because he spent time with me when he didn't want anything. And then Emmanuel Scott went and sat down. The air was so thick in that room because we knew exactly what he was saying. How many times is our intimacy with God based on our wish list instead of just wanting to spend time with the lover of our souls? Everything that we have been blessed with, you know this, comes out of His graciousness, not of how good we are. I'm praying that God, may our response today be when we learn our identity is who you created us to be and how you saved us through Jesus And then we come, Lord, to say, I want to know you. I want to know you, God. I know I'm going to fail on a daily basis, but, you know, I want to know you. I want to know you intimately because my life, someday this earth suit is going to play out and I I just want to be in your presence. Even when I want nothing. Let's pray. Lord, today... um, Lord, there's there's such a desire in my heart for your bride, your church, to long for you. Because, Lord, I just confess, my prayer for Central is that we be a group of people that long for close relationship with you, not just some religious institution. Lord, you can do more through your presence 
in five minutes than we could do, even dream up in years to want to do. And Lord, I know today in this room, first of all, there would be some people that have to say, I have never even come to any kind of relationship with Jesus. And to that person, I would say, listen, He is knocking on your door. He is saying, I love you. I went to the cross for your sins. And today I am offering true life to you. Forgiveness, wholeness, completeness, intimacy. And the Bible is so good that it says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, when somebody reveals their name, when somebody reveals their name, they're revealing their themselves to you and that's what the Lord is doing I, I am Savior, I'm Lord and there's some of you in this room that the tyranny of the urgent the curse of busyness has destroyed your intimacy with God you've become a religious person and it almost makes you sick because you see it and you long for so much more and maybe today is a day of just coming to Father and saying listen, Father I just repent of that. And, and Lord, together, would you show me, show me how to draw close to your heart? Lord, I, I don't know how you're speaking to hearts. I know I wrestle with this stuff all week and somebody just gets 30-minute dose. And, but Holy Spirit, would you please work right now? Draw us close to your heart. Let's stand, church, if you would, please. Prayer, prayer teams, would you come on out? Just This is a time with just you and the Lord. In fact, whatever posture you need to get in, just to grow close to Him. I think what's going to blow your mind is, is that when you draw closer to Him, He draws ever closer to you, and other things seem to come into focus. See, I even believe that what's going on in our nation right now is that it's, it, it's time for the church to awaken and draw close to Him. And as we do that, then we start to see the peace of God flow. Great awakenings happen. So however He's calling out, these steps are an altar to be able to come kneel and pray. The Lord's Supper is on my left. If you need that intimacy with God, just come. Let's let this be a time of drawing close to Him right now. Father... We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.